Greetings, everyone. I'm Lisa Klein Piro, and this is Seth Shapiro, and we're both from Admissionado. And we are going to talk about acing the MBA interview today. And we have a set of slides to go through. And then towards the end, we are going to be doing a mock interview, sharing some uh, great examples and some bad examples um, so that you can begin to practice on your own for uh, your MBA interview. So the chat is open. So if you have any questions as we're going along, please post them in the pod and we'll do our best to answer them during the presentation. And then if not, we can also have some time at the end to share, uh, to discuss the rest of the questions. Um, so this is our uh, live session on acing the MBA interview. Um, and the real focus of this discussion today is on how the MBA interview is different from your typical job interview. So most of you have probably um, prepared um, an, at least one time for a job interview and have understood what it takes to um, nail that job. But the MBA interview is somewhat different. And so we're going to go over what's different about it and how you might start preparing for it. Um, so uh, one example that we wanted to share with you is uh, Wharton has done in the past a team-based interview. Um, and that is a very different type of interview than your traditional interview. Most schools will do one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews and those will either be with admissions counselors or they will also be with um, alumni. And these one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, will be with each candidate at different points in the uh, admissions process. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking today about Wharton's team-based interview. Um, we're going to focus more on the uh, individual interviews. So let's talk a little bit more about how MBA interviews are different than job interviews. Um, so business schools really value diversity of thought. And so in a typical job interview, or interview, your interviewer knows a lot about the job you're applying for. They know a great deal about the experience that you bring to the job and how your skill set matches up with the skills required for the job. However, in an MBA interview, your interviewer most likely will not have a depth of experience in your industry or in your particular job. And the technical skills and the specific job competencies that you bring um, and that got you towards that interview are not necessarily going to be the ones that are going to make you stand out in that interview. Um, and so, you know, being an amazing consultant um, and, and really focusing on how you would ace a certain job is not going to be what makes you stand out among the really diverse pool of applicants that that interviewer is speaking to. And so when an interviewer is comparing applicants across a diverse set of industry sectors and backgrounds, they're not using a rubric based on past experience. They're evaluating you based on your future potential. So just keep that in mind as you go forward. It's not as much talking about what you have done in the past, but what you can do in the future, because that's the basis for those comparisons. Um, the approach that we take with our clients is to focus that preparation on mastering the narrative. And so as you sit down to think about how you're going to prepare for the interview, remember that 90% of your time should be spent thinking about how you're going to tell your story. All right. This is your narrative, your story, and you have to prepare beforehand what those key highlights are. You may not get to talk about all of the pieces that you want to, the, the, the important stories that really fill in the details about your brand. So you're going to have to think about how you want to prioritize those highlights. And that's really going to take up the bulk of your preparation time. 10% of your time is going to be focused on um, why this program? So you're going to do some deep dive into understanding what's unique about the program that you're applying to and perhaps um, focus in on some specific details that really fit with your skills and your objectives. But the bulk of your preparation is going to be on your story. And, and we'll spend a little more time about that, uh, talking about that in today's discussion. So we want to um, introduce or reiterate, if you've heard about this before, the STAR framework for answering interview questions. And for every question you're asked, 
think about this STAR acronym. Situation, the task, the action, and the results. You need to focus on getting out those four pieces. And what I've also found is that focusing on those four pieces, it, it really um, stops you from just going on and on and on. And some people, when they get nervous, they tend to just talk. And you want to avoid that too. So by focusing on situation, task, action, and result, you'll know when you're done telling your answer to that question. Um, so focus on setting up a brief setup for what the situation was, what your task or your objective was in that situation, what action you specifically took, and then what were the results. And as you want to be as tangible as you can in discussing those results. Um, numbers are always good. And then wrap it up by what you learned from the experience and how you have used those, those, th those outcomes and how you will continue uh, to leverage what you learned from this experience going forward. So let's talk a little bit about how to prepare for some of the most common questions. And uh, we have a list here that we'll share with you, and I'm sure there are many other places online where you can find common questions. But what we recommend is a note card method. And this can be actual physical note cards, or it can be um, computer-based note cards. And what you really want to do is um, write out the answers to those questions and make sure you have bullets with three to four words on each. You're memorizing your ideas because when you're asked that question, you don't have time to read your notes, okay? And you also wanna make sure that you're answering the questions with your top stories, okay? So for every question, have that top story in mind. Um, and you wanna be able to focus on the key points you wanna get across, not exactly reading a all of those details. Um, and as you have these note cards, you can then flip through them and make sure those ideas come to the top of your mind. Um, so that is one way to prepare for those uh, most common questions. And as I mentioned before, if you um, have any questions at all about what we're covering, um, please type in those chats. Uh, now, we're going to talk about how you can prepare for specific interviews um, and really focus in on those um, precise answers to questions about particular schools and particular experiences. And for this, I'm now going to turn this over to my colleague, Seth Shapiro, and I'll hand this to you, Seth. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. And I will pick off here. So basically... When you think about preparing for your specific interviews, it really is very school specific. So each school kind of takes its own approach with its various nuances. So make sure you, you pay close attention to what information the school is providing you and how best you can utilize that information to make yourself the most prepared candidate possible. So in some cases, a school like Columbia Business School actually does let you know who your alumni interview is ahead of time. So you can do some research. So in this case, you know the interviewer identity. You can do some LinkedIn research, maybe some Google searches. Most people these days kind of know how to get information through various indirect ways. And the idea here is not to stalk them necessarily, but just to get a better sense for who their background is, what are their interests, um, where they came from, prior to going to business school and where they are now. Um, in other cases, uh, the school themselves will actually provide you with some sort of prompts. So they'll give you a list of general topics that might be discussed throughout the course of the interview. And that's basically them giving you a hint as to what you should know and how prepared you should be. So make sure that you are well versed in these topics, but bear in mind that there are going to be other topics that could be discussed. So it's not intended to be um, a truly exhaustive list. Um, and in general, regardless of what the what hints or what school specific uh, clues are given to you, you should bear in mind that you should come to this interview knowing the school like the back of your hand, as they say. You should know what classes, what clubs, what conferences, treks, and so forth are applicable to the school and to your specific story. The idea here is that you should be able to tie your story and who you are to what the school has to offer so that when the school grants you admission, they say, we know that this candidate is going to be well-connected. 
So one of the key components of business school, both from an admissions perspective as well as the experience itself, is that it's a very international-based program. Um, so inevitably, you're probably going to get a question about how am I international? How have you had international experiences? And you should be prepared, no matter what your experiences are, to try and answer that question or sets of questions. So, for example, if you've worked abroad or if you you traveled abroad for work and you've actually physically been in another country, um, that's something you might want to bring up in your interview. And as Lisa mentioned, you should definitely utilize the STAR framework to kind of help tie your story together very effectively. But let's just say you don't really have a lot of international experience because you haven't left your country or your, your job doesn't really key you up for working internationally, um, you still should be able to talk about experiences you've had culturally. Maybe you have actually had a remote experience working with someone internationally or in another geography, or you, you've had an issue that may have been affected by something that had an international component. Whatever it is, think outside the box and say, oh, you know what, I actually do have a worldly view of how things operate, and here's how I can bring that to bear. Um, and, and lastly, um, you know, not every international experience needs to be professional in nature. It can be something where, again, you may have traveled there for some sort of leisure activity. Maybe you served in the military um, and you had to go abroad for something of na that nature. Maybe you did volunteer work in another country. Um, anything where you can think of that might have a very global geographic scope could be worth uh, mentioning in your interview. So inevitably, no matter what interview or what school you have an interview at, you're going to get a, a component um, at the end of your interview, usually about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the relative length of the interview, about, well, what questions do you have for me? Or more specifically, what questions do you have about our MBA program? And you best be prepared for this. There is This is a, a shoe in of the process as there is. And so the idea here is not to ask questions that are very generic in nature, like, well, what did you enjoy about your experience if, say, your interviewer is an alumnus? Or what does your program have to offer? The idea is that you should, again, have researched this school very carefully, um, and you should have very uh, detailed questions that are, again, specific to you. So when you come into the program or the interview, for example, you'll say, well, I know that so-and-so school has this club or offers this type of class, and you know my interests are aligned with it. But the question is, well, how can I get more involved? Or is there something a nuance to that? And the idea is you're by default showing you've taken the time to research the school, shown how it aligns with your interests, and are ready to contribute. And that will leave a lasting impression since it is going to be the last thing that the last form of interaction that you have with your interviewer. So make sure you have anywhere between, I'd say, four to six really well thought out questions with the idea that you might also have some follow ups based on what your interviewer tells you. So this should be somewhat obvious, but like we're doing a, a virtual discussion right now, um, most schools, if not all schools, in fact, have pretty much eliminated um, the in-person interview that was very commonplace uh, in the process in years past. So that shouldn't cha doesn't change your 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 strategy. It just may change some of the tactics, right? So the general idea here is that you should still treat this as you were an in-person interview. So obviously, you should be dressing in business formal attire unless otherwise indicated. Obviously, you should be wearing pants <laughs> um, and, and dress as if you're ready to show up in person. And it will also help your mindset as well to be able to kind of say, I'm dressed to impress. Um, make sure you have a professional background, be it a neutral one, a green screen, or something where it's very, uh, very well well manicured and very professional. Make sure you eliminate any outside noise. Create a very sterile environment. And prior to that, practice, right? Practice in this environment so you're not coming to the interview the first time with having all these sort of X factors that could potentially make you seem less than professional. Um, what you should also do when you're practicing for some of these virtual interviews is engage with people that you know who may have gone to these schools, um, may actually interview for some of these schools, and just get a little bit of the cadence uh, speaking in front of a screen, maybe there's a delay um, in the back and forth. Make sure you've kind of 
test drove driven the car first. Don't let this be again your your first experience. And then to the extent possible, though I'm not a good a good modeling of this last bullet point, but um, although I do have anti glare glasses, um, if you have the option to wear contacts, it might be a good idea just in case there's some sort of sunlight or some sort of light that would would make the visual less appealing. So again, it all just comes back to test your environment. Make sure you, this is not the first time you're you're going through it. You know, Seth, I want to add one more thing is that I think that the virtual environment does have some advantages. Um, you can put up sticky notes around you to remind yourself, you know, smile or your three top stories. I mean, no one can see what's here. Um, whereas if you went into a live interview, uh, you wouldn't be able to bring in any notes. So use that to your advantage and make the environment um, as, as friendly as it can be for you and make sure you have cues if you want um, to have some reminders for yourself. Yeah, that is a great point, um, right? You do have all these extra things that are off screen, right? <laughs> now, of course, also don't be looking at your phone. Don't make sure when you're doing that, you know, it's still within the visual parameters of, of your environment. And and I'll just I'll just say before we we get to uh, oh sorry we have one more slide after this. I was going to yes. Uh, do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, please. I was going to okay. sum up with admission okay. on before we do some okay. Lines. Okay. So, so one other thing that this is just kind of human nature is that people like to hear themselves talk, especially MBAs and especially MBAs who, uh, who interview. And the idea here is that it is okay if your admissions uh, interviewer, be it a, an alum or an admissions officer directly, um, talks a fair amount, right? People like when they're expressing, talking about their experiences, what they enjoyed about their program. The fact that if they're an alumni, they're doing this means they're obviously, they think very highly um, of their program. And so it's completely fine to engage in more of a conversation at some point, as opposed to having it feel like a more Q&A type of environment. Certainly you don't want to be an interrogation of any sort, uh, but the idea is if you can sort of form a connection with your interviewer and have it be a back and forth where it's almost an iterative discussion, you might find that it actually is more favorable for your chances. Though bear in mind, if your interviewer doesn't go down that path, that by no means it's not going well. So, uh, so yeah, so that is that is pretty much our slides. We're going to, um, I'll just say a couple quick things before we do a mock interview. Um, here at Admission Auto, you know, one of the things that, uh, or a few of the things that we do that's really helpful to kind of get you off the ground here is we actually do collect a lot of the questions that um, are asked um, by, uh, by many of our clients. So we create a very exhaustive list. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll obviously see those same exact questions, but from year to year, you'll tend to see many of the same types of questions and the uh, general structure to how an interview is formed. So we're happy to kind of run through those things with you. And another service that we offer, which is helpful, speaking of the virtual interviews, is we actually do mock interviews ourselves. And so because we're all on Skype or other sorts of virtual communication, we can help with the idea of simulating what this interview experience will be like. So if that interests you, we definitely suggest reaching out um, to kind of secure our services uh, to kind of help prepare you to, to perform the best you can. Um, Seth, we had a question. Let me just ask, can we just answer one question here before we go to the mock? Because I think it Absolutely. ties into this. Um, Someone has asked, what are some questions you would ask an alumnus and what are some that you would ask an ADCOM member? And I think that that's that, you know, as we've talked about questions to ask, I think that's a really good differentiation. Um, and one I'll just add in mine, I'll turn this over to you afterwards, Seth, but remember the alum, um, you can ask them a lot about uh, the types, of, what did you find most helpful? What were the most, uh, the courses or experiences that most contributed to your success? You can ask them about the value of the alumni network after they've left school. Um, you can ask them a little bit about how the program might have changed since they've left because uh, alumni interviews usually um, keep up with that. When you're talking to an adcom, you'll re you can really focus in a lot more on um, details about what is happening at the school now. How's the program changing over the next year? Um, you might want to ask a little bit about COVID um, because um, obviously there's a lot of changes that are going on in terms of classroom modalities and different types of field experiences. So you can ask about the specifics of those as well. Seth, do you want to um, address this? Any Anything else you want to add? No, I, I think you hit it right out of the park. I think the basic question you have to ask yourself is, will this person be able to answer it? 
you know, you don't want to necessarily ask an AdCom member something that an alumnus would be able to answer and vice versa. So know your audience, because if you if you if you're coming up with a list of very prepared questions and it doesn't fit the environment, it won't work. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, Lisa, we actually do have a, um, some other questions as well, yeah. if you'd like to take one. So um, one person asks here, when we start telling our story, should we start with our weaknesses and how we overcame it, or should we start with our success and achievements? Um, well, it's unlikely that you will be asked to tell your whole story. So it's unlikely that someone is going to say, okay, so um, Seth, tell me the story from the beginning. They're probably going to focus on very specific pieces, as you'll see in our mock interview. What is your greatest, um, tell us about a time you failed. What do you think your greatest strength is? And so you will have to answer questions addressing those very specific questions. Um, if you are ever asked to tell your whole story, um, I think you have to try out how that works and you wanna make sure that you stay as succinct as possible and don't start, you know, start with the abridged version of your story and let the interviewer ask for elaboration. Absolutely. Okay. So this is another question here, which I'm going to paraphrase slightly, but it's basically asking what are the approximate odds of getting an admission post interview? Now, and I think this brings up actually a very good point. I'll just take it uh, answer from here, but Lisa, certainly feel free to chime in. I will say this, the interview in and of itself is not going to get you in, but it can prevent you from getting in. And what we mean by that is, um, in, the interview was just one of several components that that uh, that will be considered when in your final decision by an admissions committee. So you want to treat it as seriously as you can, and and but bear in mind that it's not going to be the final marker. They will gather the interviewer will get the the write up or the admissions committee will get the write up from the interviewer, whether it's an office an admissions officer or an alumni interviewer, and they will factor that in as part of like seven to 10 components. But if you don't do well on your interview, that could potentially prevent you from getting in. So you wanna be relaxed, you wanna be confident, you certainly don't wanna be arrogant, and you wanna make sure that you're speaking slowly and clearly so that the information that you're sharing um, comes across. And I'll say one other quick thing, you should also check with the school based on your research, and we certainly know this here at Admission Auto, whether the school, uh, the interview itself is blind or not. And what we mean by that is if it is a blind interview, the interviewer knows very little information about you. They might know your geography, your current background, uh, a few basic facts about you, but they have not read your application. A non-blind interview means that the interviewer is very familiar with your application. And so you can potentially reference information out there, in there. If it's not, you have to bring that information to the table. Does that sound good, Lisa? <laughs> that sound, that, that's an excellent answer. Um, okay. I think we have a couple of others. Why don't we do the mock interview? Because I think some sure. of the answers we give will help you um, and will inform some of the questions you have, and then we can pick up with those questions afterwards. Um, so what we're going to do, let me just uh, show you the questions that we're going to be asking here. And uh, we were, we're going to show you, I'm going, we're going to take turns and I'll interview Seth and he'll interview me. And we're going to give you some bad answers and some good answers with some explanations of what makes them bad or good. So my first question is, um, Seth, tell me about a time when you persuaded someone to do something they didn't want to do. Hey, Lisa, thanks so much for the question. So one time I had a direct report uh, who was leaving every day at 3 p.m. instead of finishing his work and being on call until 5 p.m. when his shift was supposed to end. I asked him not to do this and threatened that I would write him up if he persisted in this practice, but he continued these actions anyways. I reported him to my supervisor who told him that he would be fired if he continued to shirk his duties. After that, he stopped leaving early. I wish we had a voting button here, but we're gonna vote on that's not a great answer. And the reason that it's not a great answer is that, um, the question really asks about a soft skill persuasion. And when you strong arm somebody into doing something, it doesn't really highlight your persuasion skills. And on top of that, something about this answer is problematic because in the answer, Seth said that he had to report him to his supervisor. 
which means that Seth couldn't solve the problem on his own, but had to take over, you know, turn to his boss and say, help me solve this. And that really doesn't showcase um, responsibility in the way that you'd want to. Um, so let's let's try this again. Seth, tell me about a time when you persuaded someone to do something you, they didn't want to do. So when I was leading marketing efforts at, as the uh, North American marketing manager for Honeywell, I realized we had the potential to gain serious momentum in our smart smoke detection systems in the U.S. municipal segment. When I'd follow up with the decision makers on the client side, I'd hear over and over again that they liked our systems more than our competitors, but that they couldn't go with us because our warranty wasn't as good as, as that of our competitors. So I was able to convince the marketing team of the need for warranty enhancements, um, but it was extremely hard to convince legal and finance to modify the warranty policy itself. So in turn, I used sensitivity analysis and convincing illustrations to support my case. And as a result, I was able to persuade senior management of the need to and the how to to improve our warranties. And ultimately, it helped me convince the legal team that it was worth the risk. So after we changed our warranties, we ended up booking over $160 million in new business revenue, and eventually we became the market share leader in two years. It is now one of the fastest growing segments in my division. So that is an excellent answer. So um, let me just give you some insights to that. So the top points. Um, Seth did utilize the STAR framework. He gave the situation, the task, the action, and the result. And he also showcased an example where he persuaded a stakeholder over whom he had no formal control. Um, and that's a really important skill to be able to influence other people without authority. And he was able at the end to wrap this up by quantifying the results um, and, and showing that it had both short-term and long-term impact. So excellent answer. Thank you. Now let me turn it on you, Lisa. Is there anything about yourself you'd like to change? <laughs> I wish I didn't work so hard. I wish I worried less about work. I wish I cut myself some more slack. I'm really hard on myself. And I wish I could give myself better work-life balance. So unfortunately, this wasn't a great example, <laughs> a great type of response. This is what we call false modesty. It's actually sort of a way to compliment yourself or turn a weakness into a strength. And admissions committee members will see right through this. They want you to be honest. It's okay to be vulnerable. The interview is a, an opportunity for you to show your best attributes, but it's also an opportunity to be honest. So make sure you answer the question honestly. And if it's a negative type of question, make sure you turn it around in a way that showcases ultimately how you overcame a weakness. So let's give that one more try. Lisa, is there anything about yourself you'd like to change? Well, sometimes I fail to see the forest through the trees. I've, I've gotten feedback at work that I build the best and most comprehensive financial models in my Houston associate class. But sometimes I'm so focused on making sure my numbers are correct that I, I fail to see the why or I fail to explore alternatives outside of the model. I also find financial modeling really satisfying and fun. And so I focus on that perhaps at the expense of the bigger picture. And and it's critical. I've gotten some critical feedback on that, um, and one of them is from uh, Jacob Isaacson, who did write um, one of my recommendations. He's been a wonderful mentor and has really been an advocate for me, and has helped me um, identify ways that I could start to see the bigger picture and bring that into my overall analysis. Uh, I'm getting better at it, but I still think there's a room for improvement. Now, this is a good answer. This is uh, a real honest self-assessment. It's the exact opposite of what the previous answer was. It's a real fault rather than a humble brag. It showed, Lisa showed that she had been given constructive cr cr uh, criticism and acted upon it accordingly, and that she's committed to improving herself. Business school is a transitional period in your life. You want to be able to show that you're gonna be learning from your mistakes and making yourself a better person in the long run. Okay, let's go on to question number three. It's my turn. So Seth, tell me about a time when you failed. So when I was in college, I was driving in an unfamiliar area to help a friend pick up her car at the mechanic. I was exhausted after staying up all night working on a physics problem set. And on my way home, I caused a terrible car accident. I turned the wrong way on a one-way street in downtown Cleveland and was hit by an oncoming car that actually had the right of way. 
Unfortunately, the woman in the other car broke her wrist, and as a result of the impact, uh, she had to require surgery. While I walked un away unscathed, even though my car was totaled, um, I took full responsibility. Ultimately, my insurance company settled with her within my policy limits, and I'm happy to say she was compensated for the pain and suffering I caused her. One result of this accident is that now I'm much more mindful of my surroundings when I'm driving. I research directions and routes ahead of time when navigating an unfamiliar area, and I don't drive when I'm excessively tired. This is an important part of my work now, as I currently spend 80% of my time on the road as a consultant, and I'm frequently in rental cars. Okay, so we flipped this around on you a little bit, and that was actually a good answer. Um, and it is a good answer, even though it was not related specifically to um, something that, um, he, a failure that had to do with work. But it did show that Seth, um, you know, he, this was a real failure. He made a big mistake, but he was willing to take responsibility for it right away. And then again and again over time. So at the scene, he wrote a letter and then in the trial. And it really, um, he really demonstrated um, his fortitude and, and the way that his ethical um, perspectives drove his decision making. And then at the end, he really also focused on how he is going to make sure he doesn't make that mistake again. And I want to focus on that piece because... One of the keys to being successful is being able to learn from your mistakes. And that's what Seth showed in his example. So the example isn't as important as what he's learned and how he's going to make sure he can prevent such failures. So uh, let's try another one here to give you an opposite side of what um, an answer might look like to this question. So Seth, tell me about a time when you failed. So one time I had somebody working for me who really, really messed up. He actually sent the client the pitch books for another client's deal, creating a major control room and confidentiality nightmare. We had to ultimately fire that analyst, and it created major conflict within the group and the two clients who were impacted. Okay. Um, now, you can probably already guess by this point, that was a bad answer. And the, the, the straight and direct reason it was bad is that Seth didn't take any responsibility. I asked him for a time when he failed and he told me how someone else failed. Um, and so in, in doing that, he's, he's shown that he's not, there's nothing he's really taking responsibility over and learning from. Um, so make sure your example really does highlight uh, what you've learned from your failure. Okay, great. Thank you for that feedback. Lisa, I've got one more for you. So what is your immediate career goal post MBA? Um, I'd like to recruit for investment banking or consulting, and I'd like to be CEO of XYZ Company, um, which is a $500 million company. Okay, so we have some room for improvement here. <laughs> um, one of the things that's problematic with this type of response is it shows a little bit of indecision. Investment banking and consulting are two very different career paths. Um, and you don't want to show that sort of indecision when you're, you're at an MBA interview. Um, you need to have a good idea about why you are pursuing this type of job um, and, and recognize that they're very different from one another. Um, you need to talk about uh, wanting to do something that maybe has some similarity with your background, um, but that maybe transitions into a new area. So stay away from answers that are too too broad as well too. Like I want to be CEO of a big $500 million company after graduating from business school is likely not going to work and not very specific. You have to have your career goal thought out, but not so specific that it seems unrealistic. So try and find that balance, but certainly you can improve upon this. So let's give it one more try. Lisa, what's your immediate career goal post MBA? Well, my experience in sales and marketing at J.P. Morgan um, provides me with a good marketing foundation for my post-MBA goal um, of moving into luxury retail marketing. Um, I hope to leverage the foundation that I've gained leading the marketing efforts um, for private banking in Latin America, um, my, cult, my language fluency, um, and my, uh, the marketing coursework at Kellogg to work as a brand manager um, for the Latin American market for a luxury company with a really good relationship with Kellogg, um, something like LVMH or Hermes. Um, 
And I really believe that the foundation that I've built at JP Morgan and the experience that I uh, obtain at Kellogg will provide me with the skills that I need to launch a career in luxury retail marketing. Great. Now, this is a solid type of answer. This is a particularly good answer because the goal itself or the career goal path is imminently achievable, but also relatively ambitious. So it has that balance. Um, the example Lisa gave also incorporates the strengths of the school, in this case, Kellogg, and the knowledge of the school specific recruiting landscape, right? You ultimately want to be able to show that you went to your interested in that school and it'll help tie you to your future goal. So that's particularly helpful. And again, the, the goal itself was very clear. It had a certain amount of clarity to her answer and there was a sense of purpose. It was very well thought out, but it wasn't overly drawn out. And so this was the type of effective answer you'll want to give yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I think that ends our mock interviews, but I see we have a lot of questions in the pod. So um, Seth, do you want me to start out with one and then you can take, we'll, we'll swap out here. Sure, um, sounds good. Um, so uh, Nile has said, if we face any odd question for which we don't have an immediate example or relatable story, what's the appropriate way to deal with such questions? Um, and the answer is really that I think you can prepare for them and, and, and you can have broad categories if they ask about something in my background. This is the story that I want to tell. If they ask about a specific goal, if they ask about um, my university experience. So prepare with those categories. Um, and I think the more you prepare, the, the better able you will be to respond if you get an oddball out question. Um, and in, in all, my experience in working with clients um, and preparing them for interviews, they ve very rarely get something that they were completely unprepared for. Um, because most of we we know what the admissions officers or the alumni are looking for in these interviews. So um, those out of the ballpark um, questions are really rare. But I think you can be prepared by making sure you're focusing on your key stories. Yeah, and I would add also it's completely fine in the interviewer to take 10 seconds to think for yourself. What seems like 10 seconds to you is a very short amount of time to your interviewer. And so it's help. It's sometimes good to be able to kind of pause and reflect and show you're actually thinking through the question as opposed to sounding very robotic and almost having everything rehearsed. That's a great point. And you can also ask for clarification. If you're not really sure, you can say, excuse me, are you looking for, and ask a little more, and maybe that more prompt will give you some more information to go on. Great. Um, Lisa, we have a question here. It is, is it better to tell stories about your job experience or university? Or is it better to do a combination of both? So I would say that certainly it is both are fair game. Uh, the MBA interviewer, or the MBA process starts pretty much with your college days and takes it all the way to the present. And so it is totally fair to pull on both. Now, if you're an older, slightly older candidate, a story from your freshman year in college may not be particularly relevant about who you are today, but if it answers the question and you can tie it to the present day, that may not be such a bad answer. I think you have to look at every single question and say, what is the most effective way to answer it? Is it something from my, my earlier past or something from my recent past? And based on that response, or uh, based on, on your interpretation of the question, both should be fine. Exactly. Seth, I think um, I think you hit you hit the nail on the head there. I think that focus on what it's telling about you rather than where the story took place. Right. That's what you what do I want the answer to this question to focus on? Um, and that's really so uh, wherever you can find the best story to support that, I think will work for you. Um, I, we do have another um, we question. Shall we mention our motive of choosing that particular B school? that a school has a strong alumni connection to a dream company. Um, so let's imagine, I guess, that the question is, why are you interested in this school? Um, and I think it's fine to talk about a specific industry. I might not um, suggest talking about a specific company because that really narrows your target. I'm going to this school so I can work for this company. Um, 
But I think the better argument is I'm going for to this school because they have a strong foundation in this industry in terms of alumni connections, coursework, club work, ground that in the industry perspective. And you may want, if you perhaps are interested in a particular company or industry, it would not hurt to do a little bit of networking before your interview, or maybe you can cite that in an interview. I've talked to these people who are an alum, uh, alumni of your school, and they told me how to, their experience at said school helped land them in that job. So you can sort of indirectly identify that alumni are popular there, but ultimately, again, tie it back to the program, as Lisa mentioned. Okay, we have another question here, which is how long should your answer be? This is actually a really good question. Um, you should, there isn't an exact amount of time. I think you have to do use your best judgment. In some cases, and I know this was the case at, at Harvard Business School, they will let you go on as long as you want to talk about a particular question. They're not going to pause you and, and, and sort of cut you off at a certain point. So be wary of that. <laughs> um, the point is, is you should be able to prepare your answers. So there's no, I think a minute is probably a safe bet. If it's a longer question about, um, you know, tell me about yourself or sort of your opening question or two, you may want to provide a little bit more of a setup. But this is where the practice comes in. Make sure that if you're doing a practice with a friend or uh, an alumnus of the school, uh, make sure that you're getting feedback from them about whether your answers are sufficient, um, whether they went on too long. And you can also tell, too, in a lot of cases, even in a virtual environment, when someone is sort of drifting off their eyes, kind of look the other place um, and so forth. Now, they will, they could also add, be taking notes. So don't assume that if they aren't making direct eye contact with you, it doesn't mean they're not listening. Uh, but the point is, is keep your answer short, make sure you kind of follow the STAR framework um, and move on to the next question because the general belief is that there are a list of questions that they have to get to and they have an allotted time as well. Excellent. And I think, I just wanted to add, I think it's also okay to have, you know, after you give your bridge version, you can say, um, would you like me to elaborate on any part of that? You know, ask if they want something deeper. Maybe you've said something, but I think it's always better to ask before you go on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know. Do we have any other, do you see any other questions? I don't see any other questions. So now is a good time to ask them um, if you have any. I'm scrolling through. And, and again, I'll say in the interim while we're waiting for any other questions to come in, um, again, please feel free to reach out to us at Admission Auto. Um, we do schedule free consultations if you're interested in our services. Um, uh, we're still taking clients for round one, although if you are looking at round one, I wouldn't wait too much longer as deadlines are creeping up. But um, you know, there's a lot of changes that are going on this year with the pandemic and defer deferments and things like that. And we have plenty of educated people and knowledgeable people on our staff who can help you answer them and get you set up with the right person. Oh, we do have a couple of questions. Wait, yes. Okay. Is there any, I'll take this one here. Is there any okay. difference in interviews between a, a second year student and an admissions committee member? Yes. The interview itself, and this is certainly based on our own knowledge as well as anecdotal information that we've received, that these are sort of different interviewers uh, or different interview experiences. You'll find that a second year student is going to be, for the most part, um, a little bit less knowledgeable about the ins and outs of the history of the admissions committee and the program. They may not be as well versed, though many of them do go through pretty extensive training. Um, they obviously are a lot younger for the most part than admissions committee member, though not necessarily the case. So there will be differences. Um, they're also a current student, so they won't necessarily be able to speak to post-career opportunities in the way in which an admissions committee member may have more knowledge about. Um, as far as the relevance is concerned, um, Lisa, what do you think? I, I always get this question a lot, and I don't think there's a definitive answer, but usually if it's an ADCOM member, they tend to be more aware of your application. Again, this idea of the non-blind, but that isn't always the case. Yeah. I, and yes, I agree. In general, the second year student will likely not have seen any part of your application, maybe a resume, but most likely blind, but the ADCOM may have more knowledge about it. Um, but I would, but I would treat both interviews with the same amount of seriousness, right? Again, you shouldn't be compromising on your performance just because of who the audience is. Yes. Um, 
Okay, so let me start. I know that there was one after that. How should your hand gestures be while answering questions? And it's funny that you ask that because I tend to be somebody who uses my hands a lot. And when I'm on Zoom, I notice that more than I've ever noticed it before. What I would say to you is just be yourself. Um, and, and, you know, yes, you know, make sure they're not flying in front of you all the time, especially if you're using a virtual background and you move your hands around a lot, it won't come across well on that virtual background, but just be yourself. Um, and, and, and I, because I think if you try not to, you might start, you know, sw swiveling around or just make sure you're, you're telling your story in your way. Um, because I think at the end of the day, what you want is you want your own passion to come through in a way that's comfortable for you. Seth, do you have anything else to add there? No, it's perfect. Do your, okay. I mean, again, if you find you're wildly mm -hmm. like this, you know, you, you could sit on your hands if you felt mm -hmm. that was a distraction. But again, this just comes back to our key advice, which is practice, practice, practice. You'll be able to see certain, it's the same kind of thing when you hear yourself being recorded, right? Or you're listening to a recording. You may notice things about yourself or the way you speak. Perhaps you speak too quickly or you do too many hand gestures or you blink a lot. <laughs> you know, just don't make this your test drive. Okay. Um, so another question, is it okay for it take a few seconds to think about a good answer? Yes, we talked about this. Absolutely. You should, you know, you only get one shot at it. So make sure that, um, make sure that you, you take the appropriate amount of time to make sure you've thought through your notes, your, your answer. Again, we talked about the note card method earlier in the presentation that should help you kind of remember maybe your key talking points. Um, one thing I'll also add, just as this is just something that comes to mind, and I certainly do this with a lot of my clients, is I sometimes recommend, and this is just a variation of preparation, but that they put together sort of a, a matrix um, with the idea that one axis or one side is going to be um, the attributes that you think best represent you. So maybe like five to seven, for example, communicative, uh, confident, uh, organized, whatever they may be. And then on the other side, put maybe five to seven major anecdotes or stories about um, your life to date. Um, and the idea is that you'll look at this matrix and you can check off boxes where you see there's overlap. And the idea is that if you can kind of internalize this matrix, it'll help you come up with answers and sort of use stories across different questions so it makes them more versatile as opposed to having to prepare questions with specific answers. That may work for some people, other people maybe not. You know, it's really whatever makes you most comfortable and most confident. Right. Excellent. Um, there's a question here. I'm normally very comfortable with interviews and find um, my past interview experience becomes slightly informal. Um, I think you should take your cue from your interviewer. And I've had, um, my clients have had a wide range of experiences. For some where people, you know, they just sat around for half an hour and it felt like they were just chatting. And some that went through very formal process. So take your cue from the interviewer. If they start to be more informal, then you follow along. But if it's an interviewer that really wants to stick to the questions and answer them one by one, then use that as your framework. Absolutely. So uh, there's a couple other questions here. We've addressed them. Um, one of them is, in, in these COVID times, most of the interviews this year are likely to be conducted online again. Are there any particular things to keep in mind for online conversations? Um, I believe this this uh, discussion is recorded, will be recorded. So I would definitely urge you to, to rewatch uh, earlier parts where we speak specifically to the fact that these are now almost exclusively virtual interviews. Um, again, it's just, there are just certain best practices related to creating the right environment. Um, to some of the, the good best practices we see in creating an effective environment. At the end of the day, um, as Lisa and I have talked about, this can actually work to your benefit if you practice and if you set the right tone. But it will not, it will not um, uh, harmful, uh, harm you in any way. Okay. Um, uh, we have another question here, which is what kind of end of interview questions should we ask? Again, this is covered in the presentation. The idea is make sure they're well-researched and they're specific to you and the school itself and that they go one step further rather than just asking for information that you could easily look up online. Excellent. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? I think we've, we've answered almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Seth, and uh, thank and if and I think that uh, we've posted in the chat pod here more information on Admissionado. If anyone is interested in contacting us um, and finding out a little more about what we can do for you, thank you very much for having us. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe.